Hi guys, happy Sunday. Um, we're continuing our um, series this week on locked down but not locked in and it is my pleasure to share this with you this morning. Um, it's getting a little bit boring now, isn't it, this whole lockdown thing. Um, but this, I don't know about you, but this series that we've been looking at has given us some really, really good teaching on how we should be, um, how we should um, deal with this position that we're in at the moment, our lives at the moment that are so heavily affected um, by what's going on globally. And in fact, probably never more um, has our life ever been affected by, by a global issue as it is being affected right now. Um, so this morning, I would like to introduce you to a lady called Esther. Um, Esther is a book in the Old Testament. And as we're going to see, we will see um, about how she was actually just like us. She was locked down, but she refused to be locked in. Now, this story takes place um, when the Jews um, were in exile. Now, they had been taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and they were living in exile in Babylon um, or Persia, which is now modern day Iran and Iraq, that, that uh, region. Now, there was um, a young girl called Hadassah and she was being looked after by Mordecai, um, who was a, a member of her family. And he is caring for this young girl in his family and this young girl had been orphaned, so he's looking after her. Um, and they are fairly close to the royal court. Now, one day the king has a drunken party where he orders his wife, Queen Vashti, um, to come before him and his friends and show them how beautiful she was. Vashti refuses to do this and ultimately she loses her place as the queen. The king sends a decree throughout the land, strengthening the patriarchal culture, as the male officials of his court were all afraid that Queen Vashti's disobedience would be mirrored in their own wives. Insert eye roll emoji here, yeah. Um, the king then misses his wife, okay, so she's dismissed from, um, from being his wife, and, and he then decides that he misses her. So he decides he needs another wife. You see, we're, we're, we're valuable girls, actually. They, men need their wives. Um, so virgins are sought throughout the land and brought to the palace to audition for the next queen position. So seeing a benefit here for Hadassah's future, Mordecai sends Hadassah. Um, he changes her name to Esther, because it's less Jewish. And remember, these Jews are under occupation. So the, the king of Babylon at the time, which was Nebuchadnezzar, had come into Jerusalem and um, conquered the area and taken Jews back to Babylon, um, or as we now know it, uh, Persia, or as we used to know it, Persia. Now we know it as Iran or Iraq. Um, and these Jews were held in captivity. And they, they basically had to serve um, the, as slaves. Um, they were um, very, very, uh, uh, well, locked down. <laughs> there is no other phrase, really. They were locked down. They, they had no freedom. They, um, they were the slaves of the ruling empire. And so the last thing that you really wanted to do, if you could get away with it, was... Um, admit that you were Jewish. So um, Hadassah's name is changed to Esther and Mordecai takes her to the king's court as part of the this group of virgins that have been um, taken and they're going to audition for this role as queen. So Esther moves into the palace with the other virgins and she begins to undergo the 12 month beautifying process that the king insists on. And during this 12 month period, Esther becomes well loved by all who know her. And when it's her time to spend the night with the king, 
because that was the point. You you made yourself beautiful over like a 12 month period. And then the king would spend a night with you. And so night after night, he would take a different virgin into his bed. And that would be how he decided whether or not you were good enough to be the queen. Again, more eye roll emojis. She's loved by the king. OK, he falls in love with her. She's loved by the other concubines, the, the virgins. She's loved by the eunuchs looking after the concubines. And she's especially loved by the chief eunuch, Hegai. Now, meanwhile, Mordecai has discovered a plot to kill the king. Um, he overhears, um, he's sitting out at the city gates and he overhears a conversation one day. And it's a plot for the king's eunuchs to overthrow him. And um, he tells Esther... He tells Esther about this and Esther tells the king. And Mordecai is also then well thought of because of this loyalty. And this loyalty is written down in the king's chronicles, which was like a diary thing. They're writing down uh, things that happen in their, in their um, lives. Obviously, they're recording history, so they write it down. Now, there's another character in this plot um, called Haman. And he is serving at the king's court and he's being promoted to a higher and higher status. And he begins to get very fed up because his status is so high that all the people across the land bow when he walks through the city, except the Jews. Who remember are in captivity in Persia, so they should be bowing to him because everyone else is bowing to him because that's how important he is. But they won't walk past him and bow. They, they just walk past him. They won't bow when they walk past him because that would be breaking the second commandment. And obviously, they're not going to do that. They're keeping their laws. They're keeping their faith. So he hatches a plot to kill the Jews, every single one. He gains the king's approval by saying that the wealth of the Jews will be added to the king's bank account and a day is set where all the Jews will be killed. Now, the Jews are being told that they will all die. OK, so this, this plot is hatched. Um, Haman's going to have all the kings, uh, all of the Jews killed, and all of the money is going to the king's coffers. And the Jew, this is announced to the Jews. The Jews are told that they're all going to die. And this is the action they take. They dress themselves in mourning clothes and begin to mourn. Now, Jewish mourning involves sitting on a low stool or on the floor and basically not doing anything. They tear a rip in their clothes, which is meant to um, be a, a public display of how sad they are. They've ripped their clothes um, and they basically do nothing for seven days or longer if the if it's a close relative that has died so if your if your parent dies you're supposed to stay in mourning for a year for 12 months and you can't come out of that mourning until the anniversary of the uh, the death of your parent so the jews have been told that they're going to die that they're all going to be exterminated there's going to be a complete annihilation they are all going to be killed and they've even set a day for when this is going to happen and what do they do? They dress in sackcloth and ashes and sit around crying. Mordecai also dresses in funeral clothes and he mourns and wails and cries outside the gate of the king's palace. The Bible tells us that where, wherever there were Jews who heard about this across Persia, there was great mourning with fasting and weeping and lamenting and they wore sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai asks Esther to appeal to the king, but Esther knows she's not allowed to approach the king without an invite. And if she does, she could be killed. But you see, Esther had underestimated the good favour that her actions had given her. She didn't know that everyone loved her. She was unaware of how the king saw her 
And when she does finally agree to take this to the king, he welcomes her with open arms. She invites him to a feast that that she's going to prepare for him. And she invites the villain to Haman. Now, the king remembers in this time, while this is going on, how Mordecai had saved him and he wants to reward him. Okay, so he's reading his chronicles one day. Um, He knows that the Jews are going to be killed. He knows about the plot that Haman has hatched because Haman had to get the um, approval of the king for this for this plot. So we've got so this is where we are in the story so far. The Jews are going to be annihilated. Esther knows about it, but is afraid to ask the king to stop it. The king knows about it, but he just thinks that that's what's going to happen because Haman, who is quite favoured by him, has said this is the best thing. Mordecai is sat at the, at the, church, at the city gates, crying and mourning and wailing, and, and the other Jews are all doing that too. And during all this time, the king reads his chronicles. He reads back over his chronicles and he, he sees this, this man, Mordecai, and, it's, and he's reminded about what Mordecai had done for him. So he calls Haman to him and he says, what should I give a man as a reward when he has honoured me? Now, Haman gets very excited at this. He is proud enough to think that the king must be talking about him. And he begins to list this huge amount of rewards, royal robes that the king has worn, the royal horse that the king has ridden, and let and, and let people lead him on that horse through the city and have everyone see it as it is proclaimed that this is the man that the king wishes to honour. The king says, great, that's a brilliant idea. Go and do those things for Mordecai. Haman is, of course, furious at this. And he complains to his wife and his family. But even as he is doing this, he is summoned to the king to attend this feast that Esther has prepared. Now, Esther is clearly very anxious about asking the king not to kill her people. She has not revealed to him that she is Jewish. Remember, she changed her name so he wouldn't know she was Jewish. He holds her people in in captivity and it actually takes two banquets that she prepares before she finally plucks up the courage to tell the king about the fate of her people that Haman has plotted. Eventually, she tells him about Haman's plan to annihilate the Jew, the Jews and hang Mordecai, by the way, because Haman is so fed up with how Mordecai has now been um, honoured that he's built a special gallows to hang Mordecai. There's lots of twists and turns in this plot. And although the king knows about the annihilation, he doesn't know they're Esther's people. Esther wants to save them. Mordecai doesn't know he's going to be hanged and he's still wailing and crying. And eventually Esther plucks up the carriage and she sees the king and she goes into him and she uh, approaches him. She could die if he doesn't want to see her, but he holds out his scepter, which is a sign that she is welcome. And she invites him to these, this feast and then she's still too scared to say anything so she invites them to another feast and then eventually she plucks up the courage and she tells the king that these are her people and that Mordecai is her guardian and that Mordecai that the the man that he has honoured is going to be hanged by Haman on a special gallows that he has built and the Jewish people are going to be annihilated. Now, the king is angry. He loves Esther, even though he has just found out that she is no more than a member of those who were slaves to him. And he orders that Haman is hanged. And get this, on the special gallows that he had built 
to hang Mordecai on. So the king stops the plot to kill the Jews. Haman is hanged on Mordecai's gallows and the Jewish people are saved. And Esther is the one who has saved them. Now, this story is a spectacular one that includes good versus evil, a villain, a king, a princess, a queen, the salvation of a people group. And the Jews today, even in their festival of Purim, remember this part of their history in truly dramatic fashion. They all dress up in fancy dress. They pour out onto the streets and they're partying and dancing and singing and celebrating the escape from annihilation that Esther orchestrated. And in the synagogues, the story is retold and it's read out from um, the the, the Tanakh, from the the, uh, scrolls. And the congregation have rattles that they shake every time Haman's name is mentioned in order to drown out the name of this villain. It is a very important part of Jewish history and it all happened because one locked down woman refused to stay locked in. This whole story smacks of of captivity. The queen Vashti, who was penalised because she didn't want to provide some sort of sexual display for um, her husband and his mates. The men being afraid that their wives might rebel um, because Vashti had rebelled and they might copy her. Um, The gathering of the eligible virgins, the beautifying of them and the prospect of one night with the king um, to see if he wants you as a wife or not. Esther is not only locked down because her people are in captivity, she is also locked down by her gender. She cannot function on many levels. And yet, though she took some persuading, she eventually acted, turned history on its head and is still celebrated today. So let's have a look at what we can learn for our own lockdown situation from the story of Esther. So first of all then, how should we react to this lockdown. Well, when the Jews were taken into captivity and, you know, they were always being captured and taken into exile by one ruling dynasty or another, they would be conquered by a global power, either the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, you name it, they all conquered Israel. Anyone would wonder what the fuss is all about, about this tiny little piece of land that God promised to Abraham. Anyway, The superpower would conquer their land, take up residence and rule over the Jews in the land. But they'd also take huge groups of them back to their own empire to serve as slaves. And this meant that the northern regions of Canaan became very watered down because there was raping and pillaging and intermarrying. And the Jews that were taken back to the other countries formed communities within their captivity. And quite a lot of their scripture Um, was written during their time of captivity. I mean, if you think about just, you know, we all know the song by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Yeah, we wept because we remembered Zion. That's all about captivity. If you're sitting by a river in Babylon, then you shouldn't be there. You need to be remembering Jerusalem. You don't belong in Babylon. You're, You're there under occupation. Um, obviously, that song is taken from a psalm um, and what, which was written in uh, captivity, it's written in exile when the Jews were captured and were slaves in Babylon, which is the same period as Esther. So they formed these communities, but they were very unpopular. Um, following their laws meant that they were prolific in their reproduction. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but, you know, a woman in Jewish um, culture is unclean for seven days after her period. So during her time of her period, sorry, guys, yeah, I did just say period. Sorry about that. Um, 
So during the seven days of her period and then the seven days afterwards, she is not able to sleep in her husband's bed. She is unclean. So even today, this happens. So she has to sleep in a separate bed. And then seven days after her her monthly period, she goes to the mikveh and she baths and she's then ritually cleansed. And that night she can go back to her husband's bed. Well, I don't know whether you've ever done the sums, but that puts her in her husband's bed directly as she starts to ovulate. So therefore they were prolific. They had lots of children. They grew a lot. Two weeks separation and then back in your husband's bed um, really only results in in marital uh, relations that um, leads to to babies. Sorry, I was struggling knowing how to say that because the youth might be watching. But you know what I mean, guys, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. And um, and of course, following Yahweh meant that they would not bow down to any other gods or leaders and they didn't want to break the second commandment. Um, do not create for yourselves an idol. Do not worship any other gods before me. Um, they were unpopular. They were easily conquered and they spent many years being held captive to global empires. But God always kept them. He always loved them and he always rescued them. But never, ever did they remember this. Every time there was a new conquering nation, every time there was a new problem, the Jews complained and grumbled and wailed and cried, trying to get God's attention in the hope that he might do something, change something, bring a miracle, bring a saviour, bring hope. They forgot that hope was always theirs. Salvation was always theirs. They were his special people. They were locked into a restorative, transforming relationship with him. They forgot that they were a light to the Gentiles. They forgot that God will bring all things for their good. They forgot about Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Moses and how God worked for their good, even when someone meant to bring evil upon them. They forgot and they forgot again here. They heard that there was a plan to kill them and they forgot who God is. They forgot his saving nature. They forgot who he is and they mourned and they cried and they wailed and the whole empire knew that their pity party was happening. Now, don't get me wrong. Potential annihilation is a massive issue. Um, Don't hear what I'm not saying here. Of course, they should have been upset. I would expect them to be upset. But that is the problem. This was such a great issue that there was nothing they could do to change it. So why weren't they turning to God? What have you forgotten? What are the massive miracles and acts of God in your life that you have forgotten? Have you reacted to this lockdown like the Jews did? Are you wailing and moaning and questioning every decision? Are you on Facebook saying, why are these idiots out? Why aren't people doing as they're told? Are you criticising every move the government makes? Are you challenging their motives? Are you cynical about who's going to pay for this? Or are you realising that everyone is doing their best and actually God has got this? He has to have it because no one else has. If there is one thing that this pandemic has taught us, it's that we have no control. Not even over our own lives. And that actually is a freedom that is life changing. If we haven't got it, and we know God has got it, then we can trust him. If we don't know what to do about this situation, but we know that God does know what to do about this situation, then we can trust him. Remember all his promises. He loves, 
he saves, he reconciles, he heals, he comforts, he turns all things for good. He's got this, even though we haven't. And he will turn this lockdown for good. So how should we behave then? My second point, how should we behave in lockdown? You see, actually, Esther took a lot of persuasion. She wasn't much better than the rest of the Jews to start with. She was afraid. She maybe didn't know the history of the Jews. Maybe she didn't know how God had worked throughout their history. But really, that's not an excuse. The Jews purposely keep their history alive by retelling the story every year at Passover, by understanding the root of their Sabbath rest, by following the mitzvot. If she had been born into exile, she would still know the stories. But that is the problem with religion over relationship. If you are following religion, the stories become just that stories. They are not loving memories. They are not acts of love and grace. They're not acts of mercy. They are just stories and they lose their meaning. The Jews always had it wrong. The law was not meant to restrict them. It was meant to be the foundation of a loving community in relationship with their God, acting as a light to the Gentiles bringing others into that relationship. But that didn't happen. Behaviour became more important than love. Being right was preferable to being righteous. Law overtook grace, mourning instead of dancing, fear instead of joy, and their religion became all about what they did rather than who they are. But God worked, even through this. And he brought Esther to the fore. He made her highly favoured. He organised that people loved her. And when the time was right, he brought her to the point of her purpose. As Mordecai said to her, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What is your such a time as this? What have you come to the kingdom for? And how can you fulfill that purpose? What can we do whilst in lockdown that will mean that we proactively discover what our such a purpose, such a time as this is? Will we rise up like Esther, overcome the fear and the anxiety of being discovered? How many of you suffer from imposter syndrome, by the way? I certainly do. This is the feeling that one day someone's going to discover that you actually aren't as kind as you try to be. You're not as clever as you think you are. And actually, you're completely and utterly winging it. Esther must have felt like this. She didn't want her Jewish identity revealed. She was afraid to die. She was afraid of losing her place of favour. I mean, who would want to give all that up because you'd expressed an opinion? She knew what had happened to Vashti, but despite all of that, she came through and God continued to work for her. All her fears must have been evaporated in that moment when the king held out his golden scepter, the sign she was looking for, that she was allowed into his presence. And then her hopes must have risen again when she realised that she was going to, oh sorry, her anxieties even must have risen again when she realised that she was going to have to out the highly favoured Haman to save her people. But she did it. She came through. She submitted to the will of God. She literally took her life in her own hands, despite her captive status and despite her fear. 
and God honoured her and saved her people. You are a child of God. Why are you afraid to do what he wants? He is a loving father. He would never send you into a dangerous environment without having your back. He would never allow you to receive death before it was your time to go home. He has rescued you in the past. He is the only source of salvation. He loves you. Maybe it's time to step out. You might feel that you're being held captive by the wills and the ways of the world. Maybe you feel trapped in sin, but you long to live a different life. Maybe you have a people group to save. Your family, your friends, your workplace. Throw off those chains today that hold you down and step out. Just do it. Do not be locked in to a place where your freedom is restricted. Do not be locked in. How can we be useful like Esther was? How can we do what we needed to do? How can we find our purpose in this lockdown? How can we step out for Jesus? How can we make that simple act? Do not be locked in to a place where your freedom is restricted. Step out. Do what he needs you to do. Your simple act might just save a people group. So thirdly then, how can we be useful? Esther's captivity as a Jew, as a woman, as a wife, led to the freedom of the entire Jewish nation in Persia at that time. But look at how she did it. She used the skills that she already had in her hand. She cooked a meal. She invited the men to the banquet. She behaved with humility. She used her skills. You are a masterpiece. You are created in the image of God, which means you are infinitely precious. You are created for a purpose. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. When God ordained your birth, he knew you'd be in lockdown. He knew you'd be anxious. He knew this would be hard and yet he created you anyway and he has given you the gifts and skills to be useful in this time. This is your such a time as this. This is your chance to find the gifts that God has put in you. This is your time to find your purpose. It may be large it may be small, but it will be yours, your unique gift, your infinite purpose, your divine purpose. You are enough. You can do it. And who knows, you might even save a people group. But just one person would do, wouldn't it? The world is currently flocking to Jesus. Billions of people are looking for answers. Thousands of churches are reporting exponential engagement with their online services. Bible sales are through the roof and you are a part of this. You have the answer. You know the words to eternal life. You carry the keys to the kingdom. This is your such a time. Grasp it. Work with it. Embrace it and free it. We may be locked down, but we are never locked in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are created in your image and we are precious to you and we are uniquely gifted. Lord, I pray that through this lockdown time, 
we will be able to find our purpose. We will be able to explore our gifts. We will use this time to read our Bibles more and to come closer to you and to be able to speak about our relationship with you. We may not be able to save our own nation, but we can save our family and friends by speaking of you because you are the one who offers salvation. You are the one who saves. You are the one who has all the answers. Amen. Thanks for this morning, guys. Um, Have a great Sunday and see you in the week. Bye.